You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 33, Sonnet 32. What if I say I'm not like the others? What if I say I'm not just another one of your plays? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? We all know William Shakespeare from his plays, but relatively few people know much about his sonnets, which is sad because it was pretty much the only writing that he ever actually published, and its contents form the backbone for the rest of his magnificent body of work. If you're just listening into this podcast now for the very first time, welcome. While you could jump into this podcast at any episode, I do recommend checking out episode one just to bring yourself up to speed on the background and the framing. It's only been three and a half years since I last published an episode. The twenties for me and my family have so far been full of madness and fury, blessings and curses, and I guess we're still waiting for that magical moment when we find ourselves somehow used to the new normal. My family and I went through most of the pandemic in Cape Town, South Africa, and our experience of it was combined with a particularly long and arduous immigration process. Right now, I'm still pinching myself that we've been in our new home for just over a year, and I'm finally managing to put together this episode. Regarding the graphic novel, Mr. Cat and I have managed to put out considerably more pages. We're currently working on page 30, which is most of the way through the first sonnet. If you're not familiar with the work so far, please go and visit www.sonnetcomics.com, that's with an X, and see for yourself. I also continued getting images of the sonnets tattooed onto my body, and since the previous episode, they've passed my shoulder and very painfully worked their way across my chest and down to the bottom of my belly. Sooner or later, I'm going to have to make a decision about how to cross over to the top of my thigh, not just artistically and tastefully, but also whether and how to get the fantastic Mr. Sean Fawkes to fly over to Israel to continue his amazing work. Designing the tattoos, at least when we were designing them, proved to be a rather enlightening exercise in and of itself. One great moment, for example, was realizing that Sonnet 15 perfectly describes traditional cell animation, in which moments, words, images, or sonnets, are presented in a sequence to tell a story. The cell that is most rich in youth is the one currently being viewed. On the one hand, the bard's poetry could be considered centuries ahead of its time, but on the other, is this not how... Words and sentences of stories have always worked? That would make animation a visual extension of the written word, and I just love that idea. To my patrons, I could never fully express my gratitude for your generous support and for showing faith in a project that I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. You play a crucial role in making this work, so thank you, Thank you, and thank you again. Sonnet 32 If thou survive my well-contented day, when that churl death my bones with dust shall cover, and shalt by fortune once more resurvey these poor rude lines of thy deceased lover, Compare them with the bettering of the time, and though they be outstripped by every pen, reserve them for my love, not for their rhyme, exceeded by the height of happier men. O oh, then vouchsafe me but this loving thought, had my friend's muse grown with this growing age, a dearer birth than this his love had brought, to march in ranks of better equipage. But since he died and poets better prove, theirs for their style I'll read, his for his love. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 32. If thou survive my well-contented day, when that churl death my bones with dust shall cover, and shalt by fortune once more resurvey, these poor rude lines of thy deceased lover. The word survive appears twice in the sonnet sequence, here and in sonnet 81, 
Just as it does today, it meant live beyond, suggesting the sonnets outliving their creator. Well, as mentioned before, meant both in a satisfactory manner and also hole dug for water or spring of water, referring to the spring in which Narcissus sees his reflection. So well contented day could mean the time of Shakespeare's life when he lived, or when he wrote the sonnets, or while his son was still alive, but it could also mean the days of his life filled with him staring at his reflections, working on the sonnet sequence. In the latter case, it could also be a pun and read as will-contented, meaning filled with William Shakespeare's spirit and intent, in which case this quatrain is describing a situation where both the sonnets and the reader survive Shakespeare and his days spent engaging with his reflections. The word churl had various meanings in early Middle English, including man of the common people, a countryman, husbandman, and free peasant. By 1300, it meant bondman, villain, also fellow of low birth or rude manners. It takes us back to Sonnet 1, and it's interesting how differently it appears to be used if we read the modernized text which has introduced punctuation. If we look at the original text, however, all three appearances are not punctuated and allow for ambiguous readings. The word churl may refer to Shakespeare himself, Hamnet, the sonnet being written, the personification of death, or the reader. Death was not capitalized in the original text, so while it's possible to read the second line in the traditional way, where death is described as a churl, we can simultaneously read it as when that churl will cover my bones with death and dust. In Shakespeare's day, dust began to describe particles in the air. Prior to that, it was used as elementary substance of the human body, that to which living matter decays, or mortal life, and had figuratively become associated with confusion and disturbance. When someone dies, their truths are often shrouded by confusions and disturbances that the dead are not able to provide an answer for. Fortune can be read both as luck and wealth. In the late 16th century, survey meant to consider, contemplate, look down at, look upon, notice, guard, watch, examine the condition of, and to take linear measurements of a tract of ground. The use of resurvey here suggests not only that the lines are read after their creator has passed, but that it is through reading and rereading that the reader will become better acquainted with the sonnet's contents. Poor means poor, wretched, dispossessed, inadequate, weak, thin, or to be pitied or regretted. Rude means coarse or rough, as well as ill-mannered, uneducated, and uncultured. In Shakespeare's day, lines meant any short piece of writing, especially poetry, but this also ties in with the furrows of the husbandry theme. A naive reading of the first quatrain is, if the sonnets and reader survive the bard, and once more his wretched or inadequate poetry is fortunate to be read. The first quatrain evokes images of the sonnets and reader reaping the benefits from Shakespeare, their deceased lover, having buried himself in the sequence. It is a combination of luck and fate that brings a reader to resurvey or reread the sonnets, and it is by a combination of luck and the wealth embedded in the sonnets that the reader is able to see the bard again through the lines of the text. Compare them with the bettering of the time, and though they be outstripped by every pen, reserve them for my love, not for their rhyme, exceeded by the height of happier men. Bettering of the time is interesting in that it relates to the wasting of time mentioned throughout the sequence. Even more so, in the original text it is written bet-ring, B-E-T-T -T apostrophe R-I-N-G, so it can also be read as bet and ring. Bet currently means the mutual pledging of things of value to be won or lost based on some future event. But in the 1590s, when the sonnets were being written, it was more fluidly pledge as a forfeit to another who makes a similar pledge in return, which is an elegant way to think of a piece of writing in the relationship between an author and a reader. 
ring here could be both a circular band, as in a ring worn on a finger or a bracelet, or the sound of a bell. These interpretations combine to suggest a couple of possibilities. That bettering of the time could be a time loop of sonnet reading, perhaps making up for the waste of hours invested in the sonnet writing, or that the time spent writing and reading forms a bond between the author and the reader. Outstripped can be read as to pass in running or move quickly. In the 1590s, it took on an additional meaning of to excel or surpass in anything. Considering the original spelling, it can possibly be read as striped. The height of happier men in line 8 contrasts with the poor rude lines of the author in line 4. The second quatrain is pretty straightforward in its intentions, saying outright that no matter how much more advanced writing and poetic techniques may become in the future, that this poetry should be kept aside, preserved as much as reserved, for the love of the author contained within its lines, even when the skill that it showcases is surpassed by that of happier men. Oh, then vouchsafe me but this loving thought, had my friend's muse grown with this growing age, a dearer birth then this his love had brought, to march in ranks of better equipage. I don't know why I didn't notice this before, but Shakespeare introduced the word friends in Sonnet 29 and has been using it since to refer to the sonnets. In Sonnet 29 we see featured like him, like him with friends possessed. In Sonnet 30, Precious friends hid in death's dateless night, and while I think on thee, dear friend. And in Sonnet 31, all those friends which I thought buried. This is the second time we've encountered the word muse, the first time being in Sonnet 21, when it was used with a similar implication, that my friend's muse refers to Shakespeare himself as being painted into the sonnets, or possibly refers to his lost son. Ranks recalls the military theme established in the second sonnet, as well as a higher position in society. Equipage comes from the French to fit out, and has come to mean equipment in modern usage. Combined with ranks, we have a sense of a military outfit, which evokes an image of the sonnets as Shakespeare's soldiers marching through time. The general sense of this quatrain is that, given more time on this earth, I would have produced much better than these rhymes. But since he died, and poets better prove, theirs for their style I'll read, his for his love. The meaning of the closing couplet is clear, but there's one aspect that I don't know if I've ever considered before, the use of the words he and I. They appear in a fair number of earlier sonnets, so it's not exactly unusual, but in this context it's a little less obvious who they're referring to. If my friend's muse is Shakespeare, then it seems like he refers to the bard. But in other sonnets, the use of I appears to be written in the voice of the author. Seeing as the bard is the author, who's doing the reading in the last line? Shakespeare? The sonnets? The reader? Perhaps Shakespeare is referring to himself in the third person when he says, I'll read his work. Perhaps the sonnets are reading each other vicariously through the reader. Perhaps the sentence only works if the reader is performing the sonnets correctly by reading them out loud. Hang on, that's only a problem if we're reading the modernized text. Something interesting happens if we look at the original. Isle is spelled I-L-E and follows the word style spelled S-T-I-L-E. In other words, what we're reading is a stutter, an echo, a stylistic device for the reader to read that looks different to how it sounds. If the word aisle is an echo of the word style, then we can effectively drop it from the sentence and read theirs for their style read, his for his love. That scans much better.
While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and their breathtaking poetry is a window into Shakespeare's soul, a monument for himself and his lost son, and an enchantment cast in the hopes of securing his legacy. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording this podcast, converting these podcast episodes into a series of books, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, I need your help to make this happen. Please consider signing up to support this project at www.patreon.com slash fisherking by purchasing the paperback or ebook of Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, and by keeping up to date with the graphic novel progress at sonnetcomics.com or on any of the social media accounts linked to in the description. And if you've been playing this video on YouTube, please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not like the others? What if I say I'm not just another one of your place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender?